Got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book. Got myself a savior when I took a second look. Mm-hmm. Opened up the pages and what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of mine Funny how when you think you're right everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right by the leatherback book in his hand Hey Welcome to Word for the Weekend on RTN TV Scotland and on Moriel TV. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we begin tonight, I'm on the south coast of England and we've had technical problems in the last few weeks beyond our control for which we cannot be more apologetic, but let's hope we can get it better tonight. We're looking tonight or today, depending on where you are, if you're in California, it's afternoon. We're looking, or if you're in Australia or Singapore, it's morning. But turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter four. Gospel of St. Matthew chapter four. Heavenly Father, be with us now in the power and presence of your spirit. Illuminate your word to us, Lord, be your glory for the upbuilding of your son's body in these last days, and for the salvation of souls. In Jesus' name, amen. We're looking at the 12 mountains of Jesus, the 12 mountains of Jesus in the New Testament. Now there are other mountains we can associate with Jesus, such as Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo, concerning his return in Revelation chapter 16 and in the book of Zechariah. However, we're only looking at those passages that use the Greek word oros, oros, the standard Greek word for mountain. There's 12 major mountains in the New Testament associated with Jesus, and they all mean something for his ministry, for the gospel, but they also, in addition, mean something for us today, here and now. We could do a similar teaching of the symbolism of mountains in the Old Testament. 
In the Old Testament, most frequently, not exclusively, but most frequently, mountains are associated with God's judgment. Again, Har and Megiddo is in the book of Zechariah, or Har Carmel, Mount Carmel, where the priests of Baal were judged in the contest with Elijah, or Mount Ebal, as opposed to the Mount of Blessing, Mount Gerizim. You've got these mountains of judgment. Another, of course, is Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is where Sisera was defeated by Deborah and Yael and Barak in the book of Judges. Mountains of judgment are in the Old Testament. Usually mountains of grace and blessing are found in the New Testament. There's this contrast between the two. Even on Mount Nebo, Har Navo, Moses could not enter the land until the Messiah came, but more about that in a moment. The first mountain of Jesus we'll be looking at, the first oros, is in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 4. Once again, look with me, please, to verse 8. And the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these will I give you if you fall down and worship me. Now we have to remember all glory and power is promised to Jesus. But to bring us salvation, he underwent the process theologians call kenosis. He lowered himself to human form. Jesus could have used his divine power to get out of this. He could have just made a deal with the devil. I came to get dominion of the world all the nations, just give it to me. I don't want to have to go to the cross to get it. I don't want to have to go to Gethsemane. I don't want to have to be betrayed by Judas. I don't want to die at the hands of the Roman government. I don't want to be rejected by my own people and my own nation. I don't want that. Just give me the kingdoms. He could have said that, but he didn't. This was his third temptation. Okay, you're the Messiah. You want to be the king of kings. You want to be the whatever you are. It's been given into my hands. Now notice that Jesus does not question Satan's authority. Jesus made it clear that the world is in the power of the wicked one. When you see people saying things in their ignorance, how can a God of love and power allow all these terrible things to happen in the world? Natural disasters and wars and children dying in these awful things. How can I believe in a God? You're blaming the wrong God. It's not the God of Israel doing this. It's not Jesus doing this. Jesus came to bring salvation, and he came to destroy the works of Satan. It's just that he's giving you a chance to repent and believe the gospel so he doesn't have to destroy you too. But don't blame God for the mess the world is in. It's the fault of Satan, and it's the fault of fallen man for listening to Satan. And every time you and I, or you or I, transgress against God, we are confirming the lordship of Satan over this fallen world. Yes, Jesus will get it. He will literally reign on earth for a thousand years and then into eternity. The kingdoms of the earth will belong to him. All power and dominion will go to him. Every knee will bow to him, but Satan offered it to him on easy terms on the Mount of Temptation. Now, we have to understand the nature of the Mount of Temptation. Some of you already do from our other teachings. You've got two atoms. When somebody is born, they're born of the first atom. When somebody is born again, they're born of the second atom. There's two atoms. We know that Jesus, as the last Adam, the last Adam is what he's called, not actually the second, the last Adam, could not have just paid the price for our sins and gone to Calvary and rose from the dead. Something else had to happen first. In Mark's version of this, Jesus was alone with the wild animals. It was showing Jesus to be a figure 
like Adam. Only with the first Adam and Eve failed, blew it, got it wrong. Where they failed, the last Adam succeeded. Jesus did not fall into the lust of the eye, seeing it was good for food, the lust of the flesh, or the boastful pride of life. He could have had it all. Now, when the scripture says he was tempted in all manner as we are, that doesn't mean every sin you or I were tempted to commit. Jesus was tempted to commit that same sin. But all of these sins come from the same thing, going back to the first Adam. The Apostle John tells us in his epistle, it's the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. Every other sin comes from those things. People engage in all matter of wickedness, of murder, of hatred, of larceny, whatever, because of the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the both are part of life. Certainly sexual sin. Jesus never succumbed to any of it. That is why we are told that on this mountain, Satan departed from him until the appropriate time. Jesus had to defeat Satan on the Mount of Temptation before he could defeat him on the cross and resurrection. He had to first reverse the failure of the first Adam before he could atone for our sin. He had to succeed where Adam failed, and he did that on the Mount of temptation. Now, there is no Mount Calvary in Scripture. Calvary comes from the Latinization, from the Latin Vulgate of the fourth century, from the Greek word cranium. It's simply the way you translated cranium, which means a skull, head, skull in, in, in Greek. Uh, Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, the place of the skull in Greek, that would be cranium in. Latin, in the Vulgate, it was later Calvary. Uh, but there was no Mount Calvary. Now, we can assume or read into the text that he may have been elevated, and, and there are reasons to speculate it could have been at an elevated place. There are reasons to say that. But we can't prove it from Scripture. We can't say the Mount of Crucifixion. There is no scriptural text that says there's a Mount of Crucifixion. This is Golgotha, but there is a mount of temptation. The first Adam and the last Adam. When we are tempted, we will either go the way of the first Adam or we will go the way of the last Adam. We will either succeed or fail. Without Jesus, we are doomed to fail. We are doomed to fail. Every human being will give in to the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, apart from fellowship with Christ and the empowerment of his spirit. We're doomed to fail. But in Christ, Satan can be defeated on the mount of temptation. On the mount of temptation, Satan can indeed be defeated. Jesus defeated him there, and he wants us to defeat him at the hour of temptation. Satan will do to us what he did to Jesus. He will offer us what we want. Satan knows what we want, what our flesh wants, what the lust of the eye is, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. He knows what it is for each and every one of us. Satan knows us as well as we know ourselves. That's frightening. You have a mortal enemy who knows you as well as you know yourself. Now, God knows us better than we know ourselves. God actually knows us better than we know ourselves. But in terms of our flesh, our old nature, the devil knows what makes every one of us tick. 
what strings to pull, what buttons to push, and when to do it. The amount of temptation. He will offer us what we want. Now, we need to be careful. Jesus was tempted in all manner that we are. There was a, a terrible organization with terrible theology called Promise Keepers some years ago. Their, their doctrine was terrible. And one of their errors in their book called The Masculine Journey, written by one of their so-called theologians, Robert Hicks, and he actually did have an earned, earned PhD or PhD. He said, Jesus was tempted to have sex with other men. So because his homosexuals tempted to have sex with other men, and he was tempted in all matter as we are, therefore Jesus was tempted to do that. Or Jesus was tempted, of course, then to murder. Or he was tempted to pedophilia. Or he would have been tempted to bestiality. That is not what it means. What it means is he was tempted with the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. He was offered dominion and the kingdoms of the world on easy terms, but he chose the way of the cross. God has a blessing for you, a blessing for me, a blessing for all of us. But Satan will make you an offer. And he's a good negotiator. He'll make you an offer. But when he gives it, there's always a string attached. When God gives it, it's different. Here's the complication. Satan will just give it to you on a silver platter and then own your soul. God can only give it to you by way of the cross because of the fallen nature of man and because of the world being in the power of Satan. It's only the way of the cross. God does not give it the easy way. But when he gives it, it's the real thing and there's no string attached except he wants to be our father and love us and wants us to love him as our father. Satan wants to be our master. Fall down and worship me. I'll give you whatever you want. Now, if you tried that on Jesus, you know he'll try it on us. But Jesus defeated him on the Mount of Temptation. And Jesus will give us victory on the Mount, as it were, of temptation. Let's continue looking at this. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them. The mountain of teaching. The mountain of doctrine. The mountain of didaskin in Greek. The first mountain the Lord will bring us to may be the Mount of Temptation. Jesus went to the Mount of Temptation after the elation of his baptism with John the Baptist when the Spirit came and the Father spoke from heaven. So often, when we experience a blessing from the Lord and we are related, Satan will counterattack. But it says the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. The Lord lets us be tested. Not to find out if we're going to be faithful. He already knows if we're going to be faithful in the face of temptation or persecution or opposition. He already knows. He wants us to know. And he wants others in the body of Christ to know. Well, then comes the Mount of Teaching. 
Now we have to understand what he was doing on the Mount of Teaching. He also did a paraphrased version of this on a plane in Luke, but here it's on the Mountain of Teaching. Jesus explained the meaning of the Torah. It is a very Jewish way of teaching and explaining. The Sanhedrin had become so corrupted that they were interpreting the Torah by the letter. They turned it into legalistic game playing. They engaged in a form of argumentation still used by Orthodox rabbis to this day called pill-pull. It could be this, it could mean that. They don't get to the point. Jesus did something different. Jesus interpreted the letter of the law in light of the spirit. The letter of the law said, you shall not commit adultery. The spirit of the law said, if you even lust after a woman or a man you're not married to, you've committed adultery. God is so holy and perfect. You covet something as far as God's concerned. You stole it. The Sanhedrin voted for Bill Clinton. I did not have sex with that woman in the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Yes, he did. He just read the fine sex. He played games with the words. Jesus interpreted the letter in light of the Spirit. And he did this in a format to correct with what had gone wrong with Judaism. In the Sermon on the Mount, the eight Beatitudes, follow the synagogue liturgy still used today called the bruchot, the blessings. And he was showing what the real purpose of the law, the Torah was. The point to him to establish God's standard of righteousness and show us we can't keep his law. People played games with the letters and tried to say, I didn't break it, I didn't violate it. <laughs> Again, if you covet it, you stole it. Yes, you did. I have even heard Christians say, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. I remember during the counterfeit revivals of the drunken laughing thing and all this other nonsense, when you pointed to the fact that this was not scriptural or the fruit of the spirit of self-control, or you pointed to something that scripturally invalidated what they were doing and what they were saying. They would literally respond, these are Christians, people who claim to be saved. The letter killeth, the spirit giveth life. In other words, the Bible killeth. We have the Holy Spirit, we're free in the spirit. No, the scriptures are the sword of the spirit. Another error by some Christians called hyper-dispensationalists, the followers of John Nelson Darby, the primary inventor of the myth of pre-tribulationism. John Nelson Darby was something known as a hyper-dispensationalist. He said the epistle of James is not for Christians. It's only for unsaved Jews. It's part of the Old Testament. And he also said the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians. It's only for unsaved Jews. In other words, it's part of the Old Testament. No, it was certainly for the Jews of that time. But it's for us. Jesus fulfilled the law, and he showed the purpose of the law was to point to him. That in him, we would have those blessings, the Beatitudes, as we call them. Now, what these hyper-dispensationalists, the exclusive brethren and people like this, did and do, is they say, well, the epistle of James is not for Christians, and the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, so either is the Olivet Discourse, 
Matthew 24 is not for Christians. It's only for unsaved Jews. Complete distortion of the text out of context. But pre-tribulationism depends on that kind of a distortion. You ask most of the same people who believe in pre-dispensationalism, do you believe the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament? Oh, no, it's in the New. But it says it's for the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes, but that meant Jewish believers in the first century. Well, okay, you got that right. Do you think the Sermon on the Mount is only for unsaved Jews? Oh, no, it's the teaching of Jesus. Well, do you think Matthew 24 is only for unsaved Jews? Yes. <laughs> They're inconsistent in their hermeneutic. We come to the mountain of teaching. Jesus establishes right doctrine, a right doctrinal perspective. That begins with showing the real purpose of the law, the Torah how it points to him and indicts us to the point we have no hope other than a repentant faith in him. So we have the Mount of Temptation followed by the Mount of Teaching. But let's look at the next mountain, Matthew chapter 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus went to an exceedingly high mountain. Now, just before this, he'd been at Caesarea Philippe. Caesarea Philippe is on the western slope of Mount Hermon, Har Hermon in Hebrew. And Mount Hermon is the highest mountain in Israel. It is where Syria, Lebanon, and Galilee come together. It's over 10,000 feet. It's snow-capped seven or seven and a half months of the year. But according to Jewish history, the book of Yasher, not scripture, but history, it is where the Nephilim, recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, and referred to in Jude's epistle, where they came down. Jesus went up where the Nephilim came down. And there he was transfigured with Moses and Elijah. As we explain in the book I wrote, Har Pezzo, <coughs> this is the clearest picture we have of the parousia. We have Moses, a man who died faithful to God, but under the law, on Har Nevo, Mount Nebo. And we have Elijah, a man who never died, but was raptured. But they both looked the same as Jesus when they met him in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first. It doesn't matter if we are raptured. It doesn't matter if we are resurrected. We will meet him in the air and we shall all be the same as he is. This is the blessed hope. We can call the Mount of Transfiguration, Mount Hermon, the mountain of hope. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope is the parousia, the return of Christ. Christians who died a hundred and a thousand years ago had the blessed hope. Paul talks about this when he speaks of mourning believers who give up the ghost in 1 Thessalonians. He said, do not be overly grieved as those who have no hope. The blessed hope includes the rapture, but it is by no means limited to the rapture. It's the return of Christ. It's when we meet the Lord in the air. That is the blessed hope. It doesn't matter if we give up the ghost or if we are here at the time of the rapture. It's the same hope. We will meet the Lord in the air. The Mount of Transfiguration shows us what we shall be. Moses, when he died on Mount Nebo, could not enter the Promised Land. He struck the rock more than once, and of course we explain the meaning of that typologically. Jesus is the rock, and he could only be crucified once. By continuing to hit it, it was like the Roman Catholic Mass. He had to keep dying again sacramentally. 
But Moses represented the law, the Torah. The Torah cannot save. It can only point us to the Savior. The law can only point us to the one who can save and show us our need to be saved because of the fallen condition we are in and the fallen condition of the world. The law could not save. Moses represents the law. God gave the first covenant through Moses. But when Yeshua, when Jesus comes, we see Moses in the promised land. He couldn't enter until the Messiah came because the law could not save. But once the Messiah came, we see him walking in the land with Jesus. The Mount of Transfiguration is the Mount of Hope. We have, all of us, the blessed hope. It doesn't matter if we give up the ghost. It doesn't matter if we are raptured. We shall meet him in the air. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 4. Jesus comes to Mount Gerizim and meets the Samaritan woman. We deal with this more extensively on our old teaching that's recorded, the woman at the well. But we see this on Mount Gerizim. And in verse 20, the woman says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. You people say it's in Jerusalem. And Jesus answered, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Salvation is from the Jews. This was not an argument about real estate. It was where is sin atoned for? How is sin atoned for? Was it the Levitical sacrifices in Jerusalem that God ordained? Or was it the Samaritan temple on Mount Gerizim? The Samaritans rejected most of the Old Testament, but they kept the Torah and changed portions of it. They were Assyrian colonists who intermarried with the few remaining Jews after the Assyrian captivity of 720 BC. And they adopted elements of the faith of Israel and combined it with other things. They had their own holy mountain, Mount Gerizim. Now we have to understand Mount Gerizim is on one side of the valley with the city of Shechem, today called Nablus, in the valley. On the other side of the valley is Mount Ebal, Har Ival. That was the mountain of curse of the book of Joshua, where the blessings and curses of the Torah from Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 were exchanged. This is something we see in more than one place, two mountains in contrast to each other. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Jesus comes to Gerizim, the mountain of blessing. But there was nothing but hostility between the Samaritans and the Jews. We see this in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. To this very day, there are Samaritans who live on Mount Gerizim. I, I knew their high priest personally. They still have blood sacrifices. And there's also a community of them in the suburbs of Tel Aviv at a place called Halon. And they still argue, we have the right mountain, not Mount Zion. Now, what Jesus is saying is in the new covenant, it's not going to be about a mountain. It's going to be spirit and truth. If somebody does not have true doctrine, God does not accept the worship. And if somebody does not have the right spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, God does not accept the worship. 
You see people bowing down to graven images, praying to statues, lighting candles and incense. The scriptures say, you shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above. You shall not bow down and worship. And the word bow down, prosciutto in Greek, hishtik baya in Hebrew, when you bow down before an image, that's worship in God's definition. Oh, but I know people who love the Lord and they pray before a statue of Jesus. I've seen Lutherans do that and high Anglicans and my Catholic friends do. No. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Oh, you're unloving, you're judging, you're criticizing. Now understand what's happening here, the Sitzim Leben, the cultural setting of, of, of what's happening in John 4. It was the time of going to Jerusalem for a pilgrim feast. It was a time of extreme tension going to and from Jerusalem, from Galilee. There was violence against the caravans of Jewish pilgrims going to and from Jerusalem, so much so that most of the caravans went down the Jordan Valley. And at Jericho, they turned west and went up to Jerusalem that way, making an L instead of following a more direct route just to avoid going through Samaria. Jesus not only goes through Samaria, he goes through it at the most dangerous time of year. It's sort of like the marching season in Northern Ireland. The tensions between Catholic and Protestant are heightened during the marching season. What Jesus did was like a Protestant minister with a Bowler hat and an orange sash walking down the Falls Road in Catholic <laughs> West Belfast uh, <laughs> on the 12th of July. Very dangerous and not advised. He did something very dangerous. He went against the social and religious conventions and he talked to a woman and to a woman who would have been deemed immoral. He did this not only as a Jew, an Israelite talking to a Mongol Jew, as the Samaritans were seen, but he was doing it as a rabbi. He went against every social convention to reach out and love this woman. Now, some would say, oh, but she believed it was Jacob's well, and it's still there. Sikar, from the book of Genesis, it's what was still there. And she believed in the same God, and she believed in the Torah, or a version of it, and she believed that the Messiah was coming, and then she even believed Jesus was the Messiah. You see, she's a believer. But as soon as she began with her false doctrine, Jesus ends the dialogue and corrects her wrong doctrine. Lady, you don't know what you're talking about. Salvation comes from the Jews. The blood of those animals can take away sin, but they do temporarily cover the sin until the Messiah comes and removes it. And God ordained Mount Zion in Jerusalem with a Levitical priesthood, not a Samaritan priesthood on Mount Gerizim. Oh, but this is the Mount of Blessing. Yes, but it's not the Temple Mount. Oh, but we built the temple. That's it. You built it. It was not ordained of God. Now, this got caught up in history with King John Hedekonis and the Jews destroyed it and so forth in the Hasmonean period. But it was tremendous conflict. And we see Jesus does with her exactly what he did with the Syrophoenician woman. My apologies to those who have heard this before. With the Syrophoenician woman, the pagan woman, whose daughter desperately needed the help of Jesus, Jesus said, I can't give the children's bread to dogs. Jews looked upon Gentiles as dogs, not because they were subhuman, but because of what they ate. Dogs surround me. The, the, the compass, evildoers encompass me in Psalm 22. 
okay? Jesus actually used it in the Greek. It's a diminutive term as it's written, translated into the Greek. Puppy is almost like a term of affection. Well, it sounds like he made a racist statement, a bigoted statement to the Syrophoenician woman. I can't give the children's bread, children being the children of Israel, to dogs. What Jesus was saying was, lady, I'd like to help you, and I'd like to help your daughter. There's no doubt Jesus loved that little Syrophoenician girl as much as he would have loved the little Jewish girl. But he made her deal with her wrong doctrine. Your religion is dog food. It is unfit for human consumption. The watchtower of the Jehovah's Witnesses is dog food. It's unfit for human consumption. The Hadith and the Quran is unfit for human consumption. The papal encyclicals are unfit for human consumption. Talmud is unfit for human consumption. Tibetan Book of the Dead, Bhagavad Gita, these things are unfit for human consumption. They're dog food. We're people made in the image and likeness of God. We are not dogs. Don't eat what dogs eat. Before Jesus went any further with the Syrophoenician woman, he does exactly what he did with the Samaritan woman. Corrects her wrong doctrine. Remember Philippians 1.9, that your love may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. There are those who ignorantly and foolishly attempt to make discernment and right doctrine mutually exclusive from love. Oh, you're criticizing my Catholic cousins. No, I'm criticizing their Catholicism. Oh, you don't love. If Jesus didn't love people, he wouldn't care what they believed. Jesus never compromised truth in the name of love because he loved, he told the truth in love. That happened on the Mount of Blessing. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 4. Verse 29. He's in Nazareth. And the Nazareth, what happens? It was not pretty. The people in the synagogue were filled with rage. Verse 28, as they heard him say these things, notice the truth, got them angry. And they got up and drove him out of the city. to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built. This is what is today called Natsedet Elite. It's adjacent Mount Tabor on the north side. Now we have to understand there were two goats on Yom Kippur. This was not Yom Kippur. One goat was for the Lord and it was sacrificed in Jerusalem in the temple by the high priest. The other goat was the Ezazel. The Sa'er Ezazel, representing Satan. The Ezazel was not executed at Jerusalem. It was executed not at Yom Kippur, but at a different time after it was led into the wilderness, 90 stadia. It was taken to the wilderness of Judah and pushed off a cliff the red sash of the high priest's festal garments was cut in half. One half was tied before the Holy of Holies, the other between the horns of the goat. And the goat was pushed off a cliff and killed. Well, the reason they couldn't throw Jesus off the cliff 
was because they had the wrong goat. He was the goat that was for the Lord that made atonement for sin. The Ezazel is destroyed when Jesus returns. The two goats died at two different times. Don't worry, the Azazel is going to be thrown off the cliff. Satan is going to be cast into the abyss. Now, this was the town he grew up. It was not a town, it was a hamlet. Maybe 160, 180 people tops, historians reckon. It was essentially a hamlet or an outlying small community of the city of Sephardus, the district Roman capital. And everybody knew everybody. Families intermarried. Everybody knew everybody. This mountain is the mountain of rejection. They said to Jesus, is this not the carpenter's son? We know him. He grew up here. People who knew us before we were Christians have a hard time in coming to terms with who we are now. It's very difficult, unless they're children, most of the time, to witness the family or people who knew you before you were saved. A man's enemies will be a member of his own household. Jesus was no different. He was rejected in the place where his family was from, where he grew up as a kid. Everybody knew everybody, and they tried to kill him there. This is the mountain of rejection. We see similar accounts in John chapter 9 with the boy born blind. You're rejected even by your family sometimes. Now, to this day, with Orthodox Jews, it's the same. We have a, a member of our ministry team in Israel, and she was an Orthodox Jew, and the family had a funeral for her. They sat shiva for her. Now she's with our ministry, married to one of our male team members, but they're a, a team with our ministry, and they sat shiva for her. They had a funeral for her. We had a joke in Israel that was no joke. If a Muslim gets saved, the family also has a funeral for them, only they are at it. Rejection. We have accounts of Muslim parents, Muslim fathers, beheading their own daughters because they accepted Christ. They've even done this in the United States with their religion of peace and tolerance. Coming to a country ostensibly founded or founded on religious freedom, murdering their own children for not agreeing with their religion. There have been instances where this has even happened in the United States. But, of course, the corrupt American government will still give them visas. Money talks, so does oil, etc. But that's not our purpose tonight. Let's look at this. Every Christian will come to the mountain of rejection. It could be workmates, it could be professional colleagues, it could be clients, customers, employers, neighbors, former friends. It could be family. It could be backslidden Christians. Jesus found himself on the mountain of rejection. At some point, every believer will find themselves on the Mount of Rejection. We are told at one place that even his own family didn't believe him. At one point, at least. What happened? So Jesus, this is his first mountain of temptation. The second is the Mount of Teaching. The third is the Mount of Hope. The fourth is the Mount of Blessing. But the fifth is the Mountain of Rejection. 
Every one of us, at some point, will find ourselves on the Mount of Temptation, on the Mount of Hope, on the Mount of Understanding the Teaching of Jesus, on the Mount of Blessing, but also on the Mount of Rejection. If he went there, so will we. But look with me, please, to Matthew 24. And this had a literal fulfillment recorded by Josephus in the events of 70 AD. Jesus made it clear in the Olivet Discourse. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee to the mountains. Now again, that literally happened in 70 AD. The cousin of Jesus, who became the successor of James as what we would call senior pastor in Jerusalem after James was martyred, was a cousin of Jesus. Uh, and he was the leader. And nobody knows why, but during the Roman siege, Titus temporarily lifted it. He temporarily lifted the siege. And remembering what Jesus taught, the believers went. Remembering what he said in verse 16. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. This has a direct linkage in its imagery to the rescue of Lot, another picture of the rapture. Okay. Lot was told to flee to the mountains when Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. As we've explained in other recordings, the growth of militant homosexuality and its hatred of believers is a picture of what is going to happen in the last days. The judgment of God will come, but first the people of God will be rescued the way Lot was. And the world is heading that way rapidly. We don't know where Sodom and Gomorrah were. We find evidence of it. We find Flinders. But it's not volcanic. The geologists don't know, but they know something cataclysmic happened. Nobody can pinpoint Sodom and Gomorrah, although different people have different theories and have claimed to pinpoint it. But what we do know is Ramat Zohar, where a lot escaped to. I've stood on it many times. Incredible place. The view is astounding. You can see the whole Dead Sea Basin. flee to the mountains. There will be a time when we will flee and again meet the Lord in the air. Lot's family was rescued. The believers under Jesus' cousin Simeon were rescued in 70 AD after the martyrdom of James. There will be a rescue. There will be a mount of rescue, a mount of escape, as it were. Just think of Noah on Ararat, where the ark was lodged. It's a mount of escape. It was above the destruction. A mount of escape. Look with me, please, to the Mount of Vision in Revelation chapter 21.
Verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. The Mount of Vision. The best book I have ever read in my life, if I have said a number of times, after the Bible, the best book I have ever read is The Pilgrim's Progress. If you're a Christian who's never read that book, you need to. If you lead somebody to Christ, give it to him as a present. John Bunyan draws on this imagery of Revelation 21. You see the celestial city in the distance. After a mountain, there may be a valley, then another mountain. But every so often, at some point in the life of every believer, the Lord will, in some sense, give us a vision of the glories to come, the eternal glories, beyond the millennium. You can only see it at a distance. But he lets us see enough of it to know it's there, to know it's where we're heading, to know the direction to get there. What no eye hath seen, nor ear hath heard, hath the Lord prepared for those who love him. But we get a dim view, a glimmer of it in the distance to know it is there. There's a mountain east of Los Angeles on American Interstate Highway 10 called Kellogg Mountain. And there's a cemetery on the east side. Big cemetery, place of the dead. But when you come out of the place of the dead and you get onto the west side, you're still some distance from Los Angeles. And you've got a way to go through Corvina and Baldwin Park and all these other places before you get to Los Angeles. But you can see the skyscrapers of LA in the distance. Now, they're not as impressive as the skyscrapers in New York or Hong Kong or Chicago, but they're there and you can see them. You can see Los Angeles in the distance once you pass, pass this place of the dead. You don't look back. You look to where you're going. On back of us is the place of the dead. You look to the city, to where we're heading. That Kellogg Hill driving towards Los Angeles, when you go from Ontario Airport into LA or Hollywood or something, it reminds me of Revelation chapter 21. At some point in our lives as believers, the Lord will give us some kind of revelation of the glory to come and what he has in store for us. And again, the Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan handled this imagery marvelously from a literary perspective. Let's continue. Look with me, please, to the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 12. Verse 18. Now, this is very much like the contrast between Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. We see in Joshua, and we see alluded to in John 4. These two mountains in contrast to each other, like the Mount of Blessing and the Mount of Curse. Verse 18 of Hebrews 12. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those 
who heard begged that no further word be spoken. For they could not bear the command that even a beast touches the mouth and it'll be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am filled with fear and trembling. Now that is Mount Sinai. That is where the law was given. The Torah shows us we are condemned. It establishes God's standard and shows us we can't keep it. We are doomed. It shows us through the example of Israel and the Jews, we have no hope. We could never meet God's standard of holiness. That's the law. That's what happened when Moses went to Mount Sinai, in the book of Exodus, when they blew the trumpets and things happened that Hebrews speaks of. The people couldn't take it. We don't want to hear anymore. We can't take it. Well, those who reject Christ are going to be taking it forever. They're going to be condemned by that law. An animal has to be stoned. Now, the reference to stone, of course, is stoning to death is because of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. It shows we're killed. No, not everybody is... is under the 613 commandments of Moses. But there's nobody who hasn't heard of the 10, hardly. Uh, I'm the Lord your God, you'll have no gods before me. <laughs> you shall not take his name in vain. Don't make a graven image of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. Keep holy the Lord's day. Our Messiah is, of course, our Sabbath rest is in Jesus, and so forth and so forth. Ten. Well, by the Ten Commandments, every one of us is a liar. Every one of us is an adulterer. Every one of us is a murderer. Jacob Prash is a murderer. He's a liar. He's an adulterer. Whoever you are, the Ten Commandments say you're a liar, a murderer, and an adulterer or adulteress. Even the desire to do those things breaks the law. We're to be stoned. That's that mountain. But in Christ, we don't come to that mountain. No. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. The two mountains are in contrast. Those without Christ, and I mean the real Christ, not the plastic one on the dashboard, will go to Mount Sinai, the mount of the law that they broke, that all of us have broke. But there was one person who kept the law perfectly and never broke it, and that's Jesus. To God, as we always say, one man with no sin is worth more than all the ones with sin. That's how he could atone for all. The problem is there was no man, so God had to become a man in the person of his son, Jesus. This is Mount Zion, a mountain of Jesus, we're told in Hebrews 12. Let's look at Matthew, please. Uh, chapter 15. Verse 
the end of verse 30, and large crowds came to him. After he was departing from there, Jesus went along by the Sea of Galilee, and having gone up on the mountain, he was sitting there, and large crowds came to him, saying, Bring with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. And they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them there. The Mount of Healing. Jesus went to the Mount of Healing. By his stripes we are healed. Is healing in the atonement? Yes, but not in the way many people think. We are guaranteed a 100% perfect physical healing to never get sick again in the resurrection because he died and rose. Those who die with him and in him will raise glorious and immortal as he rose. We will not have any more infirmities. Healing is in the atonement. Now there's more to it than this. If anyone has sinned and he repents, the prayer of the righteous, and they'll be forgiven. We know that certain illnesses are caused by specific sins, but we cannot say that all illnesses are caused by specific sins. And in that case, healing is also in the atonement. When we repent of something, when God is using illness to get our attention. However, ultimately, there's a mount of healing. Ultimately. When he returns, there'll be no more illness. Now notice, on this mountain of healing, he heals everybody. But at the pool of Bethesda, he heals the one his father told him. He doesn't heal the whole hospital. <laughs> Jesus made reference to the fact that only one leper was healed in the days of Elisha. We have false teachers, usually money teachers, going around saying, and he healed them all, hallelujah, and we need to go to hospitals and lay hands on people. And he... Hyper-faith teachers. And then they tell people if they don't get healed, it's because they lack faith. This is a gross distortion of the scripture. Jesus only did what he saw his father doing. We are told even in his hometown, he could not do many miracles there because of the lack of faith. No, he did not always heal everybody. He healed the ones his father told him. But a time is coming when he will heal all who have truly believed. Well, there's another mountain. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14, verse After that, he sent the crowds away and went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. Now we have a parallel account to this in Luke 6. Understand, when you see him going up to a mountain, there's always some kind of reason to do with fulfilling the Old Testament. Moses went to a mountain to bring the law. Jesus goes to a mountain to teach what the law means, interpreting the letter by the Spirit. Well, Jesus goes to this mountain and he's alone. And he prays for his disciples. They were in a storm. It was the second time, the first time he was asleep in the boats. And he rebuked them for their little faith. 
How could he be asleep in a boat being storm tossed? Again, you will never have peace, a victory over a storm until you have peace in it. <laughs> but the second time, he's not even in the boat. We go through a crisis where we think the Lord's not with us. He's abandoned us. But Jesus was on this mountain of intercession, watching the apostles being storm tossed. And he comes down. And again, the imagery of Moses, the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy 18. And he tells Peter to walk on the water, the same as Moses brought the people through the water away from the crisis of Pharaoh. Is showing Jesus as a mosaic figure and fulfillment of Deuteron uh, Deuteronomy 18, 18. But there's the Mount of Intercession. When he died for our sins, he was alone. But he interceded for us. Father, forgive them. Intercession is not merely prayer. The Greek word entuxis is the translation from the Hebrew leh paga, paga, like in the book of Isaiah, from lehav gia, to be bruised, to be cut into, to be harmed or hurt on behalf of someone else. Jesus didn't just go to the cross and say, Father, forgive them. He was bruised for our iniquities. He interceded. Intercessory prayer has been described as taking the burden for someone else. Well, there's a truth in that, but it is being bruised for somebody else. The Mount of Intercession. When we are in a crisis and we feel the Lord has abandoned us. No, he has not abandoned us. The sense of his presence may not be there. But he sees everything. And at the appropriate time, at the appropriate time, he will come. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he will keep his word. Once Jesus rose, we see the next mountain in Matthew 28, verse 16. But the 11 disciples, Judas was gone, proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. This is the Mount of Commissioning, the Mount of Commission. Remember, only God can ordain a minister. The church has no authority to ordain ministers. The Lord's ministers are the ministers of the Lord, not of the church. The only thing the church can do is recognize who God has ordained. For instance, in Acts 13, the Holy Spirit said, Set out for me Barnabas and Saul when they were leaders were fasting and praying. The church didn't send them out, the Holy Spirit did. The church only recognized it. If someone goes into full-time ministry, if someone becomes a pastor particularly, the church can't put them in that position. God has to. If by the mercies of God, the grace of God, somebody's an evangelist, somebody's a Bible teacher, the church can't appoint people to that. It doesn't matter how many theological degrees they have. Not that it's not practically helpful to get a theological education, but it doesn't make you a teacher or an expositor or a theologian. Only God can ordain that. Be a theologian in an academic sense, but not a teacher of God's word, unless you've been to the Mount of Commission. Now we deal with this in our teaching on the book of Esther, but look very briefly to Second. Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. The Lord saved us and called us. 
Yes, he saved us from eternal damnation. And he saved us to go to heaven. But he also called us to do something in this life and in this world. Every Christian is a minister. They are not all full-time ministers, but every Christian has a ministry. Every Christian is a preacher. They are not all evangelists or Bible expositors, but they all can witness one-on-one. -on -one. Whether or not we fulfill our calling is going to determine the magnitude of our reward. Remember the parable of the talents. The Lord gave us talents. It says he gave them the talents according to their abilities. We have human abilities consecrated to God's service, and we have spiritual gifts. How faithful we are in using them is going to determine what the Lord is going to say to us when he gets back. There's a mount of commission. Well, that's 11. Every believer will, like Christ, come to the mount of temptation. Every believer will come to the mount of hope. Every true believer to the mount of teaching. Every true believer will come to the mount of blessing. Every true believer will come to the mount of rejection because Christ did. Those here at the time will go to the mount of escape. Every Christian at some point will be at the mount of vision. Every Christian will come to Mount Zion. There's a mountain of healing and the mountain of intercession. But what's the last one? Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 1. Verse 12, after the ascension, the angel said he's coming back the way he went. And after he said these things, he was lifted up. Verse 12, then they returned to Jerusalem to the mount called Olivet, or from the mount called Olivet. Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. Now let's look at this. Look at the Gospel of St. John, please. John chapter 8. The ordeal happens with the woman at the well. And we see in this particular chapter, that Jesus arrives to the Mount of Olives. Why does he go to that mountain? Repeatedly, we see when he leaves Jerusalem in order to return to it, he goes to the Mount of Olives. That's what he does. Went to the house of Mary and Martha. They lived on the Mount of Olives. Always the Mount of Olives. He leaves in order to come back. It's to the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane is on the western slope of the Mount of Olives overlooking the Kindron Valley, opposite the Temple Mount, the Har Habayat. But look with me, please, to Zechariah 14. I'm 
I'm sorry, Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. He returns. And I'll say to the people, and they will, they are my people, and they will say, and you are my God. Now, where does he return? Where does he come back to? Where do his feet stand when he returns terrestrially? Verse 4 of Zechariah 14. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, Harazayatim. That is where the, the oil to fuel the, the menorah, the lamps in the temple, was produced. This stand on the Mount of Olives. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half the mountain will move towards the north and half towards the south. The Mount of Olives has three peaks. The south one, also important in biblical imagery and history. The central one, and what's known as Mount Scopus, uh, Heart of Sophim, where Hebrew University is located today. But in between the central and the south, there is a gulch with a seismic fissure under it. The last time, there was a tectonic shift. And we're talking here something connected to that tectonic network of the Af of this Afro-Syrian rift. The last time it happened was the great earthquake of 1927 that badly damaged and almost destroyed the Mosque of Omar, the Dome of the Rock. There are those who theorize that another such earthquake has happened in 1927 could destroy the Mosque of Omar and make way for the temple to re be rebuilt. Others feel the temple will be rebuilt 70 meters or 75 meters to the north, uh, where the Dome of the Spirits is today, in direct line with the East Gate, the Shah al -Akamin. There's two theories. But what's not disputed is the gulch, the cleft in the Mount of Olives, has a fissure and it has split before and it will split again. Jesus will come back via the area of Petra, but terrestrially, his feet will literally stand on the Mount of Olives. He'll come back to the same place he departed from. Now, was in Gethsemane, he took our sin. When he leaves Jerusalem, goes to the Mount of Olives. When he comes back to Jerusalem, it's from the Mount of Olives. He stays in the Mount of Olives. Bethany and Bethsaida, where Lazarus' family, Mary Martha lived. The Mount of Olives was his home away from home when he was not in Galilee. Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, Harzaiah team, according to Acts 1 and Zechariah 13 and 14, the Mount of Olives is the Mount of His coming. The Mount of His coming. All of these mountains are important for us. The Mount of Temptation. The Mount of Transfiguration as the Mount of Hope. The Mount of Beatitudes is the Mount of Teaching. Mount Gerizim is the Mount of Blessing. Nazareth Elite as the Mount of Rejection. 
mountains of Judea as the mount of escape. The mount of vision we will see at a distance what our future is eternally. Mount Zion, the city of the great king. A mount of healing. When we get new bodies, he's going to heal every one of us. No malady, no geriatric deterioration. The mount of intercession. When we are in crisis, he is interceding for us. We have an advocate with the Father, even if we sin. Not to be taken lightly. And then we have the mount of his coming. Harazayatim, the Mount of Olives. These are the 12 mountains of Jesus in the New Testament. These are the 12 mountains of Jesus He's been to these mountains. And we will be to these mountains. There'll be temptation. There'll be hope. There will be teaching. There will be blessing. There will be rejection. There will be escape. There will be vision. There will be grace as opposed to law. There will be healing. There will be intercession. But there will be the return of Jesus. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash coming to you from RTN, Christian TV, Scotland. <music>
gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne.